welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. This is a very special episode, and I'm joined by some very special guests. I cannot thank them enough for joining us today. I'm joined by Howard and Jess of Plotting Through the Presidents to discuss the life and career of a cabinet member for our special series, A Seat at the Table. Howard and Jess, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. It's our pleasure. It's really our pleasure, Jerry. Thank you so much. Before we get started, I wanted to give you all an opportunity. I know that many of the folks that listen to presidencies also listen to Plotting Through the Presidents. But just in case there is somebody out there who hasn't discovered y'all yet, I wanted to give you all an opportunity to share your podcast, what you do, what Plotting Through the Presidents does, and just where to find you on all the medias. Yeah, of course. Um, We do a podcast called Plotting Through the Presidents. And what we do is we take deep, irreverent dives into lesser known stories about the early American presidents and founders and their families and really just dig into um, basically things that entertain me. (laughs) So I bring stories to the table and I tell uh, my lovely wife, Jess, what I found and she doesn't know what I'm going to talk about ahead of time. Right. So Howard is a history enthusiast who has gone down the rabbit hole into the founding fathers. And I'm not privy to any of these stories ahead of time. I get to react right along with everybody um, as I am less knowledgeable about history as Howard. So it's a fun ride every time. <laughs> yeah, we dig into weird things like like James Madison's hidden sense of humor and uh, Thomas Jefferson's killer ram and and stories that you you might not hear about other places. And if you do, it's just a couple of lines. And I kind of really try to dig into uh, the full story and the history and and what it means and and how we can have fun with it. And I will go ahead and admit that I have been a fan of Howard's blog, Plotting Through the Presidents, for years. It was a great joy for me to be able to read. And especially when I knew I was going into a tough day, I would go ahead and read Howard's latest blog post, have some laughs, but having Jess introduced in the podcast and having her perspective has been amazing. So if you haven't listened to Plotting Through the Presence yet, highly recommend it. And I will be posting information about their podcast as we're doing the release of this episode. So please check it out if you haven't already. Thank you so much, much. Jerry. That means a lot coming from you. Absolutely. And I cannot thank y'all enough for... Being on this episode, I planned this one specifically with y'all in mind. Oh, Uh-oh. that's exciting. <laughs> so, for our listeners out there, as usual, I have not revealed who the cabinet member that we're going to be discussing is to Jess R. Howard and chill now. We're on the edge of our seats. <laughs> the cabinet member that we will be discussing is... Thomas Jefferson. Oh, yeah. You may not have heard of him. He's he's you know <laughs> one of the lesser known cabinet members. You know. Oh, what we had a bet going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. So this is a big episode for the special series, and coming into it, and I'll admit this is probably the episode. I've thought the most about because we're still in the midst of the Jefferson presidency in terms of our narrative in the podcast. And we have talked a great deal about Jefferson throughout the last five years of the podcast. So trying to sum up Jefferson's life and career in one episode I don't want to keep y'all here all night. <laughs> and we are recording we are recording an evening edition of Presidencies here. So just to let y'all know and to let our listeners know, I have taken a little different of approach here because this is Jefferson. This is a figure in American history that has a six volume biography. There is so much, there's a wealth of information about Jefferson out there that we cannot do do justice to cover all of this in one episode. So what I'm committing to in this episode, 
we are really going to focus in on his time as Secretary of State because this episode is focused on his time in the cabinet. We're going to have to talk about his early life. We're going to have to talk a little bit about his career after he left the Secretary of State position, but we're going to try and go as high level as possible for the points that he is not in the cabinet. Just to go ahead and set some expectations out there. I feel like you're I feel like you're trying to restrain me. <laughs> and and you know, I respect it and we'll see. We'll see. I, I will do my best. I'm actually really excited <laughs> to hear him as about a cabinet member because you know, I hear a lot about his presidency, but from what I've learned from Howard, he was happier, you know, a happier person as a cabinet member. He seemed kind of torn and and disgruntled and and put upon. And then as a cabinet member, he seemed happier. Am I right or am I confusing somebody? Well, we, we will find out very okay, shortly. Okay, let's see. <laughs> so let's dive in. And Howard, I'm restraining myself. As, <laughs> as anybody who is a listener of this podcast knows, trying to be succinct is not my forte, but we are going to try for that. So- To begin Jefferson's life, he was born on April 13th, 1743 at Shadwell Plantation near Charlottesville in Virginia. He was the third of Peter and Jane Jefferson's 10 children. Wow. That's. Yeah. Yeah. 10 children. That's too many children. (laughs) So his father, Peter Jefferson, was a planner and surveyor. And his mother, Jane, was a member of the prominent Randolph family of Virginia. I know y'all have encountered some of the Randolphs in, They're in everywhere. your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the Randolphs are everywhere in early American history. They're unavoidable. <laughs> they are unavoidable. So Peter wanted to make sure that Thomas received a good education. And so he had him enrolled in a school at the age of five. Unfortunately, Peter passed away pretty early on when Thomas Jefferson was still very young. Peter died at the age of 49 in August, 1757. And the estate that he left at that point had over 60 enslaved individuals. Mm -hmm. And slavery is very much woven into Jefferson's history. So we will be coming back to this point time and again. And it's an important point in understanding Jefferson and in evaluating Jefferson. So I I wanted to go ahead and make that point. The land in terms of Peter's estate was divided between Thomas and his brother. Thomas inherited the land, which included the mountain that would come to be called Monticello. You may have heard of this. Yeah, it sounds familiar, Jerry. (laughs) I think there's a town in Illinois. I I don't know. (laughs) After his father's death, Jefferson continued his studies, and he entered the College of William & Mary when he was 16, and he studied math, metaphysics, and philosophy. He also was introduced to the lieutenant governor of the colony, as well as an eminent lawyer in the colony, George Wythe. That's a name that is very prominent in Jefferson's studies and in Jefferson's development, so we'll be coming back to him in a moment. So. Jefferson, while he was at William & Mary, became a regular part of a prominent circle. He was a regular member at these Friday dinner parties. So at very early age, he was hobnobbing with the movers and shakers in Virginia. And Jefferson later recalled that in this experience, he, quote, heard more common good sense, more rational and philosophical conversations than in all the rest of my life. Wow, that's a statement. Absolutely. So this yeah. this time in his life really made an impact on him. One notable feature at this point in Jefferson's life is that he apparently was not frugal. And he spent quite freely. Oh, just at this point? <laughs> this this <laughs> becomes a trend in Jefferson's <laughs> life. <laughs> and we see it very early on, and it would, of course, as we shall see, cause problems. Yeah, I remember, <laughs> I'm thinking of, I don't know if it was David McCullough that made a point of saying that Jefferson was meticulous about noting the the value of everything, but he never really added it up. <laughs> he didn't want to total it. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. And I would be scared to add it up as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After he graduated in 1764, George Wythe comes back into the picture. He takes Jefferson under his wing. Jefferson becomes his apprentice studying law. But with wasn't just his apprentice in terms of the law. With encouraged Jefferson to expand his knowledge in other subjects as well. And he also encouraged him to strengthen those connections with colonial leaders and the politically well-connected. So you see this, this figure in his life, and again, remembering that Jefferson lost his father early on, with becomes kind of this father figure, helping to guide him into society and culture and the halls of power. So we also see at this time, Jefferson begins his lifelong hobby and study of agriculture. He Mm. begins his garden book, which if you know Jefferson, you know he has an extensive garden book throughout his life. This is the beginning of it. At this very early age, he starts to note flowers that are growing in Shadwell. And the study of agriculture would become a key role in Jefferson's life. He would cultivate this image of himself as a humble farmer. I didn't realize that. (laughs) I didn't know that about him. He loved agriculture. He loved the study of agriculture. But, of course, we also must remember that the work in the garden, you know, he he would go out and, and get his hands dirty from time to time. But the real work in the garden and maintaining it mm-hmm. was by and large done by enslaved individuals. So Jefferson's right. hobby became their work. Mm-hmm. And I think that extended to a lot of his hobbies in that it gave him the time to put his finger in so many pies. Because I found that studying like birds and, and Jefferson and his pet mockingbirds, you could, he was an avid like ornithologist. I, and he studied birds and got all these dead birds and made notes of them and, and noted things that no one else was noting. And you could say this about so many different fields. He, yeah, he had almost too much time on his hands. Exactly. And, and that's something important to consider with Jefferson. You know, why was he free to become this jack of all trades, this person who had this wide breadth of knowledge and interest, well, there were people who were doing the hard work for him. There were people who were tending to the daily business. There were people who were, you know, tending to his gardens and all of his hobbies. And that is really important to consider in terms of Jefferson. And I imagine that we will have a discussion about this whenever we come to the point to really evaluate his his life and career and mm-hmm. his legacy. But I think that it is important to note. But he, yes, he was very much interested in agriculture, and this became a, a driving force, you know, along with all of his other interests. Jefferson also at this time began a long and sometimes tempestuous relationship with the press. <laughs> he worked in 1766 to bring a publisher from Maryland to Williamsburg to found the second newspaper for Virginia. So he was instrumental in starting up a press. And we will see this yet again in Jefferson's career. Now, was that because he was just interested or was the first press just not doing it for him? And he thought, you know what, this newspaper, uh, nope, I can do it better. I don't like what they're saying. We need a second press in Virginia and I'm the man to do it. (sighs) And we will see Jefferson do that yet again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think the latter was probably the case with Jefferson that he just felt that there was a perspective that wasn't being shown and so he started to bring in somebody else to do this but yes we we will come back to this point Jefferson was admitted to the Virginia Bar in 1767 and he took on his first client that February one of Jefferson's many biographers Noble Cunningham wrote that, quote, as a young lawyer, Jefferson was better known for thorough preparation than for courtroom oratory. Hmm. Again, we're seeing so much of what becomes what is known of Jefferson in this early life. You know, Jefferson 
was not necessarily known for his oratory. He wasn't known as a great speaker. He was known more for his behind the scenes preparations and work. I just love this thinking. Oh, go on. No, I was just going to, I just keep comparing him to Adams for some reason. Yes. Is that what you're doing too? Yeah. Okay. So maybe we're having the same thought that Adams was was kind of the opposite. He just was someone who could speak on that pedestal for hours, right? And kind of held people hostage in that way. But then, I don't even think he needed to prep. I think he'd be like, John, <laughs> go. Yeah, he just he had that he had that instinct of speaking well on the spot, perhaps. But some of his behind the scenes choices, like his cabinet members, for example, were um, were questionable. <laughs> so yeah. this is interesting. I don't know. I I hadn't um, seen Jefferson in this light before yet. Well, and and you almost wonder if maybe this is the reason why Jefferson and Adams became friends, you know, opposites attract that maybe they saw something in one another that they were respectively aiming for. So, right. Like you surround yourself with people who are stronger in those areas than you are to be more successful. I mean, yeah. And it works well until it doesn't. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It works well until it doesn't. (laughs) Until it didn't. (laughs) So another part of Jefferson's life that is rather scandalous, and I imagine that we will have conversations about towards the end. In 1768, he tried to take advantage of the absence of his neighbor, John Walker, while Walker was on a trip to New York, and Jefferson tried to seduce his wife, Betsy. Though it seems that Betsy never succumbed to the pressure, Jefferson would continue to make advances on her, even after he was married. Hmm. Did I know this, Howard? This is shocking to me. Did you tell me that ever? I think I briefly mentioned it in in a blog post, but I've never really dived deeply into it. Yeah. When it comes to women, Jefferson wasn't... Kind of a weasel. He was a weasel. Um, Yeah. And I think in a letter to his granddaughter or daughter, a daughter, I think at at some point uh, he talked about his life um, kind of advice. And and, and he said, always take things by the smooth handle. And people have always kind of talked about what that means. Like, does that mean like pick something up by the easiest part? But I've I've taken it to mean that he was a creature of convenience and um, he coveted what he saw, kind of like Silence of the Lambs. But, you know, what you see every day is what you covet. But he... (laughs) I think, yeah, if, if if something was there and it seemed convenient to him, he might fixate on it. And yeah, in a, in a way that's not always cool. <laughs> he didn't seem to like apply those boundaries to himself. I mean, I'm not sure if he was a little narcissistic or just thought, oh, that's what I want. I'm going to take it and I'm not going to really think about the ramifications of that. Yes. And I think that is something that, you know, we see in... Jefferson's overall life that he didn't always think through the consequences of his actions. And Mm -hmm. this was definitely an instance that he really didn't think through and it would have consequences for him. And I bet at the time he had no idea that it could have consequences because for most men at the time, it, what he did and, and, and worse probably never would have had consequences. Exactly. And that's the thing. And as Jefferson became more of a prominent person in the public realm, it had consequences for him because Betsy's husband, John Walker, would eventually find out about these advances that his supposed friend had made on his wife. And this would eventually become public during Jefferson's presidency, as Jefferson had a tendency to do with scandal. He just really didn't respond to it. But we have a letter that he wrote to his Secretary of the Navy in 1805, where he basically admitted that he was at fault. So he took some ownership. <laughs> he he took some ownership that, you know, he he was a young man, he had done something wrong. But yeah, there's there's this. And we're we're going to have a, a few moments like this. But you know, this is an early example of Jefferson 
having some scandal in his life. Right. Maybe thinking he's above it all. <laughs> exactly. You know, for, for high level, I feel like we're zooming in. Like, we're going to talk about the high level stuff. And then there was the Walker letter, and he popped up <laughs> in this woman's bedroom. Like, this is, we're, we're diving into some stuff here. This is good. Because, yeah, wasn't that, I mean, the details of that, I, I think it was, he, he showed up in her, her bedroom or something, and um, we don't know exactly what happened, but it sounds like it was pretty naughty. Uninvited, right? Was he... Oh, yeah, uh, very much. Yeah. So that's there's a there's multiple things wrong with that, but okay. there's nothing right with it. Nothing right with that. <laughs> to get us back to his political career, um, <laughs> please. At this point, <laughs> so Jefferson was elected to a seat in the House of Burgesses, and he would serve in that body from 1769 until 1775. Um, his father had also been elected to that body, but. Jefferson was 25 when he was first elected, and so he was younger than his father to get to that point in political prominence. And there was also this guy named George Washington that was also serving in the House of Burgesses that Jefferson, you know, he kind of knew him. (laughs) Noticed him a bit. (laughs) Yeah, this tall guy, you know, he was there. And so we have this early interaction between Washington and Jefferson. They weren't necessarily close. Washington at that point was pushing his non-importation association in response to the turmoil with the British and all that. And Jefferson signed on to that, but it doesn't seem like they were really close, but of course they knew of one another. I mean, they were in the the tall men with somewhat reddish hair club, right? I think think (laughs) they had a couple of meetings. Exactly. They had a cloakroom somewhere yes. in the House of Birds <laughs> that they met in. I, too, enslaved people. Yeah, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> we have so much in common. <laughs> so 1768 was the year that Jefferson began construction on his home, Monticello. And construction on Monticello would pretty much be a constant for the rest of his life. There were some periods where it was more intense than others. But again, this is one of those pet projects, hobbies, interests of Jefferson's that involved so many other people, some paid, some enslaved, that Jefferson, because of his position, could engage in. And Monticello was far from complete when he started courting Martha Wales Skelton. Martha was a widow at that point. Uh, She had had a child by her previous husband who had passed away, but her son, John, died before he turned one. So Mm. she's still very young. They court, they form this bond, this, this relationship, and the two were married on January 1st, 1772. And they moved into the South Pavilion of Monticello, That was basically all of Monticello that was actually constructed at that point. (laughs) It was, it was not a a grandiose place at that point. And wasn't it, it was so remote up on top of a mountain where it was, I think it was impossible to get stuff up there. So I imagine she's thinking like, where have you dragged me? What are we doing (laughs) here? There's, there's nothing. This is probably suspicious. Yeah. (laughs) Where are you taking me? In, in the middle of the winter when they actually arrived, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a lot of trust. <laughs> a lot of trust. Yeah. Apparently, things worked out because nine months after they were married, Martha gave birth to their first child, who was also named Martha. Oh. Now, most women in Virginia, uh, I, I, I feel, were named Martha. Um, <laughs> it just seems like... Uh, I think back in the House of Burgesses in their cloakroom, George and Thomas were like, hey, you know, I, I married a widow named Martha, too. Oh, with children. Yeah, yeah. It's a, that was the thing to do. They were all Mary, Randolph's. They were all Martha. Martha. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. It it was it was the name to be at the time. And <laughs> everybody had a Martha. Now, I think this is probably true. But part of me just wonders if, if historians are just lazy. <laughs> and then Jefferson married Martha. <laughs> Again. Martha was her name. 
Just fill in her name. We don't know much about her. I'm sure her name was Martha. 80% chance it was Martha. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I did go more into the two Marthas in a special episode um, earlier this year. So highly recommend if somebody listening hasn't checked that out yet, go ahead and check that out. Oh, cool. But in terms of Thomas and Martha's relationship, they ended up having six children total. Only two would survive to adulthood. Unfortunately, oh. child mortality is the reality for that period in human history and, and in so much of human history. And we will come back to that subject in a few moments. But Getting back to Jefferson and his political career, he was still in the House of Burgesses when things started heating up in the colonies over the various new acts that were passed by the British government to help to pay for the debts from what's known as the Seven Years' War or in the U.S., the French and Indian War. Slavery was also a growing issue. Jefferson, during his time in the House of Burgesses, introduced legislation in 1769, which aimed to take away the discretion of the royal governor and general court to emancipate slaves. His legislation proposed that that power was given to slave owners to emancipate. And so this is kind of a, it's a weird place because you know, technically it would make it easier for slave owners to emancipate individuals they were enslaving. Which sounds like a good thing. Right. Which sounds like a good thing, but how many were really going to do that? Right. That sounds a little problematic since they'd have to suddenly farm their own land. Yeah, I hear a lot of people in, in comments on Facebook and stuff when they're talking about Jefferson, they say, you know, Jefferson tried so many times to to free the slaves and he introduced legislation and he did this, but he was stopped at every turn. And yeah, I'm curious if, if um, your, your thoughts on that as we go along um, looking at these things and what, what he actually did and what it meant and what was defeated and what wasn't, because there's this idea out there that, that Jefferson was this, this secret abolitionist who just, his hands were always tied and there was just nothing he could do. Yes, I, I think we're gonna we're gonna have some conversations about that, and I think that there are things in his career and and that I'm gonna discuss that will help in in that discussion and evaluation of him. All right, I did want to mention that he did serve as the counsel for seven enslaved individuals seeking their freedom. He even waived the legal fee for one of the clients, one of the seven. Okay. Well, I mean, I think that's like that's like a foot long thing at Subway. Like you're you pay for six, the seventh one is free. <laughs> that exactly. Makes sense. Yeah. And though the client he waived the legal fee for did not win his case, Jefferson provided him with some money that he shortly after used to escape from enslavement. So I did want to go ahead and note that that I found as I was researching this. And again, Jefferson's views of race and slavery are very complex and we'll have some points as we go along to come back to that and help to inform our evaluation of him. But around this time, as things were heating up with relations with Great Britain and the British government, in 1774, Jefferson wrote and published a summary view of the rights of British America in which he argued that people had the right to govern themselves. Ironically, this was also the year that his father-in-law passed away, and through his wife Martha's inheritance, Jefferson gained an additional 135 enslaved individuals. Hmm. So, as he's saying that people have the right (laughs) to govern themselves, he's also enslaving even more people. Yeah, I think it comes down to their definition of, of, of people. As horrible as that sounds, I think the, there's a cognitive dissonance there that uh, sometimes it seems like he sees it, and sometimes uh, I don't think he does. It's, well, yeah. it's a situation of like not, you know, talking the talk and then walking the walk. I mean, he, he talked a lot about it and then seemed to care, but then in his actions, he clearly was still wrapped up in that institution for sure. And we will touch on this when we get to the notes on the state of Virginia. Ooh. Hmm. Bum, bum, bum. 
<laughs> Amongst these 135 enslaved individuals was also a woman named Elizabeth or Betty Hemmings and her children. You probably have heard of one of her children, a young girl named Sally. Mm-hmm. We will yeah. be talking more about Sally as we go along. By the way, if you were not named Martha in Virginia, you were named Sally. <laughs> if you were a woman, I, I think that was the law. But this is the Sally, I think. Yes, yes. <laughs> not just a Sally. This is not any old Sally. No. So we're definitely getting to that point, And Second Continental Congress is coming up. Jefferson was chosen as an alternate initially for, you know, they, they had the delegates, they had alternates just in case the delegates couldn't show up. He was named as an alternate. And when the guy he was named as the alternate for was unable to attend, Jefferson went in his stead to Philadelphia in June 1775. In terms of American history, this was an important point that Jefferson was the one who showed up. Jefferson was the one to participate in the Second Continental Congress because we have this little thing called the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> now, who was the the like Pete Best of the Beatles? Like who who couldn't show up and, that Jefferson did? Was it somebody that is lost to the history or some big deal? Do you happen to know? I was wondering that too. Peyton Randolph, a Randolph, yes. <laughs> And it's funny because Peyton Randolph actually came up in the episode that I did on Edmund Randolph, <laughs> his nephew. But yes, so Peyton Randolph, not as well known nowadays, but he was a prominent figure in Virginia politics at the time. But And a hell of a football player. <laughs> and, and a hell of a football player. <laughs> With a name like Peyton, you've got to be. Yeah. <laughs> So Jefferson goes to Philadelphia. He's one of the youngest delegates to the Congress. Again, he really didn't speak much. He wasn't a great orator, but he was hard at work on a draft of a formal Declaration of Independence. And so he coordinated with this guy, John Adams of Massachusetts. <laughs> and Adams made sure that Jefferson was named to the Committee of Five, which was assigned the task of drafting the Declaration. The committee originally turned to Adams to write it, but Adams deferred to Jefferson. And so Jefferson spent 17 days drafting and discussing with his committee members. He used the draft of the Virginia State Constitution. George Mason's drafted Virginia Declaration of Rights and other sources to pull together a final draft that was submitted on June 28, 1776. Then Congress started debating Jefferson's draft, and Jefferson was not too pleased with this. Nobody likes notes. <laughs> nobody <Especially> likes... Especially Howard. <laughs> nobody likes the editor. <laughs> Jess will give me notes on blog posts and things like that, and, and they're great notes, but I'm just incapable of taking them in a gracious manner. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> this is totally true. And Jefferson didn't really come out and express his, but you can just picture him in the back, <laughs> just kind of cringing Receding. because a fourth of what he had written was edited out, Oof. but it was finally ratified in its final version. And we had the Declaration of Independence and Jefferson would eventually be seen as the creator of that. This was a big point in his life and career, as well as in American history. So then after his work in the Continental Congress, he returned to the Virginia House of Delegates, and he worked for the Bill for Establishing Religious Freedom. This bill that he proposed would prohibit the state from supporting religious institutions or making laws to enforce religious doctrine. Now, during Jefferson's tenure, it failed to pass, but he handed it off to this guy who would become a major force and, and a major colleague, a major protege of Jefferson's. I'm thinking the word minion. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Yep. A guy named James Madison. Right. And Madison would take up the cause and get it passed after Jefferson left the House of Delegates. Jefferson was also tasked in 1778 with revising Virginia's laws. 
and he used it as an opportunity to streamline the state's judicial system, as well as push for state-supported general education, and abolish primogenitor laws, which meant that the oldest son inherited all the land from his parent, as well as entail laws, which prohibited the son who inherited the land from selling it. So Jefferson, as the third of 10 children, saw that this wasn't a fair practice. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, inheritance should not just go to one person. It should go to all the children. And there shouldn't be limits on what they could do once they inherited something. Clearly a very moral guy. <laughs> uh, I'm In <joking>. certain respects. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Like here he sees an ethical issue. Yeah, he sees an ethical (laughs) issue with inheritance, but, you know, everything else is fine. And again, that is the quandary of studying Jefferson. Right. The, you know, the hypocrisies for sure. But now we get to the point where he becomes governor of Virginia. He was elected in 1779, reelected at that point. It was a one year term. So he was reelected to another one year term. But at this time, the governorship of Virginia really had very limited powers. So Jefferson, you know, tried to use his influence, but really didn't have much power to achieve much. But during this tenure, a French diplomat, Francois Barbet Maubois. Wow, that was amazing. (laughs) I'm so impressed. Uh, (laughs) I have encountered Barbet Maubois. Before, so nice. I, I have practiced the name over the years. <laughs> I, I go at French names like a, a kid in a blindfold going at a pinata. You know, I have fun with it, and if if we get candy in the at the end, great. <laughs> that is the best approach to French names. <laughs> so this French diplomat, Francois Barbet Maubois sent a questionnaire to the governors of all 13 states. He asked various questions on the the composition of the states, the conditions in each state, including with government, geography, history, natural resources. He was really on a fact-finding mission. And Jefferson, instead of just writing, you know, a little letter or farming it off to somebody else, Jefferson took this on as a project. And it would take a couple of years, and and we'll come back to this in a moment, but this would become a major project for Jefferson and something that he was very well known for. Something that he was also well known for, during Jefferson's tenure, the capital of Virginia had been Williamsburg. It was moved further inland to Richmond, but moving it further inland did not help Richmond from becoming a target for British forces in 1781. The war was still going on. And so Benedict Arnold, also Mm. a name that you may have heard of, (laughs) was assigned the task, come to Virginia, cause some trouble. And so he made his way to Richmond. He burned Richmond in his invasion. And then General Cornwallis, who is the head of British forces in North America, ordered a cavalry force to march further inland to capture Jefferson and the members of the General Assembly who had fled to Charlottesville. Jefferson escaped, but he would be accused of not only not adequately preparing for the defense of Virginia, he was also accused of personal cowardice in running from the British. Now, at this point, I've always, I mean, what was he, should he have volunteered himself to be captured? I mean, or should he have fought them off on his own with a musket? Like of all the reasons to criticize Jefferson, (laughs) running away from people trying to capture you doesn't... Seems like what I I would do. I don't know. It seems like a good idea. Yeah. (laughs) Let's run the other direction because nothing good can come of running towards them. (laughs) And if I'm not mistaken, he sent his family off like maybe even first. Like he, it's not like he left his family behind and was like, I'm getting out. Good luck, Martha, Martha, Martha. You know, yeah. Good luck, Martha's. (laughs) Have fun. Although I think she might not have been around at that time, but some other Martha's were. So so she was, she was still around at that time. Okay. But he, yes, he did send his family off 
he fled kind of at the last moment. Um, he did. There were some enslaved individuals that were left. They were unharmed, but basically he, he left them there to as best as they could protect the property and whatever. And, and so that's not so good, but <laughs> no, that is not so but, good. <laughs> that is not so good. They were unharmed, but, but he didn't know what would happen to them. Exactly. Well, and, and he left and, them for dead, basically. Well, and and honestly, at that point, the British were basically taking enslaved individuals. They had at that point issued a proclamation: if you join our cause, we'll set you free. Wow! So and so, a good deal for them. <laughs> yeah. So, maybe. so the British were not necessarily, although they kind of reneged on that and, and there's that's a whole other story oh but, man yeah there the, the history isn't always so good but they were unharmed you know and and monticello remained standing but this was a point in jefferson's career that became a point that folks attacked him on and Especially like it, it, it was this weird nebulous point. He was at the end of his term. There was supposed to be somebody else taking over as governor, but it was really unclear where the authority lay. And as I mentioned, the Virginia governor really didn't have that much power to begin with. So what was he supposed to do? But this didn't stop his political enemies from launching an inquiry. And so Jefferson secured his reelection to the state house of delegates to defend himself. He was ultimately exonerated from official misconduct, but for the rest of his career, this would be a point that his political enemies would come back to and attack him on. And, and again, you know, as you said, Howard, for all the things that you can attack Jefferson on, really, what was he supposed to do? Yeah. I mean, I think it was very much an honor culture and uh, like, putting yourself out there and, and being responsible. And so all the things that they didn't attack him on, maybe they didn't think were a, a big deal back then. You know, it mm-hmm. was, it was kind of just shady stuff that you didn't talk about, but this was one of the things that you could judge a man on was his, his bravery and his honor and all that. that and it, it kind of makes sense why they would attack him, but really I don't see what they expected him to do, at least with the fleeing Monticello. Exactly. There was nothing that could have been achieved versus him escaping and living to fight another day. Although I, I believe he had one of the enslaved people, I think Jupiter Evans was like an explosives expert at, at Monticello. So I think he could have figured out a pretty cool way out of this, but he didn't. <laughs> so that's all I'm saying is there, there could have been some ways to stop the British and there really some have, mission impossible explosions. He could yeah. have been the 18th century Rambo, whatever. Yes. Yeah. yes. Missed yes. opportunity right there. For Missed sure. opportunity. That's going to go in his evaluation. We we will <laughs> criticize him on that. <laughs> <laughs> and so during this time that he was defending himself, serving in the House of Delegates, he also worked on completing his notes in response to Barbe Maubois' letter of 1780. And he sent this response on. This response, lengthy response, (laughs) would come to be known as Notes on the State of Virginia. And while Jefferson never intended for it to be published, it was published without his knowledge. Really? Basically, they they were like, this is so great. We've got to publish this. (laughs) How long was it? It's pretty lengthy. It's pretty lengthy. (laughs) Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. 
Jefferson was, and this is one thing that I can understand Jefferson on. He wasn't necessarily known for being succinct. (laughs) (laughs) He was very thorough. Um, This would go to press in 1785. And as noted by Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf in their book, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Jefferson intended notes to serve not only as, quote, a compendium of data on Virginia's natural resources, population, institutions, and history, but also, quote, as an occasion to reflect systematically on his new state's national character and as an ambitious blueprint for reform that would lay a solid foundation for a new Republican superstructure for his state. Whew. That's, uh, that's quite a response <laughs> to a survey. <laughs> Jefferson took this on as a project. He ran with it. And it is something that Jefferson scholars dive into to understand There is so much detail. There's so much in there. Unfortunately, there's also some abhorrent prejudicial descriptions of people of African descent and some assertions to justify white supremacy. Uh, We don't have time to go into all the details, but this will, of course, need to be discussed because... You definitely, when you read notes on the state of Virginia, when he's describing people of African descent, it is very clear that he sees them as something less than human, Mm. as something that is just not, you know, there, there is definitely a supremacy and lesser Mm -hmm. in the description. He he approaches it from almost like a, what he would consider a scientific approach as if he's, you know, studying animals. It's pretty gross. Yes. Uh, And, and unfortunately this was something that people in later generations would turn to as evidence. Here's the great Jefferson saying what we want to be said. This is proof. This is the scientific Jefferson saying that these enslaved individuals, these people of African descent are lesser. And Uh that is one of the many awful things about Jefferson's legacy. And it's a fight that's still being fought. You know, it's a, it's a fight that's still being, it's still resonating. Yes. Yeah. And for someone so into agriculture, he planted a lot of really terrible seeds for American history. Thinking about that, thinking about the the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, yeah, he, yeah, he, there's a a body of his work that can speak to to freedom and independence, um, and the pursuit of knowledge, and but there's also stuff that can speak to oppression. Yes, can can you briefly remind me of what the Kentucky Virginia um, resolution was? We'll talk about that. Oh, it's oh. coming up. Okay, yeah. It's coming up. No spoilers. (laughs) No spoilers. (laughs) So around the same time, Jefferson also suffered a great personal loss. His wife, Martha, had suffered increasingly difficult pregnancies. So, you know, six children, each one, it just seemed to get worse and worse. It took longer for her to recover. It was just more intense. And with the birth of their final child, Lucy Elizabeth, She never recovered. After four months of suffering, she finally passed away on September 6th. Jefferson was absolutely devastated. He lingered in a state of depression throughout the fall. He collapsed. He truly, it seems, from everything that we know of Jefferson, he loved Martha and her loss would resonate for potentially the rest of his life. Finally, he was pulled out of this state of depression. He was pulled out of it. And his daughter, Martha, was there with him. And and we have these accounts from her of trying to help him out of this. And he would ultimately come out of it. His friends would draw him back into public life, trying to give him a purpose, trying to give him something to be able to do. So he was drawn back into public life. He was put to work drafting a new state constitution for Virginia. 
He was chosen to represent Virginia at the Congress of the Confederation in 1783. And then shortly after, he was chosen to be a diplomatic representative for the U.S. in France. That's a lot. Like, couldn't they just, like, bring him casseroles? (laughs) (laughs) That's that's so true. Like, that seems like a lot of stress to put on someone who's grieving. (laughs) The the casserole don't didn't we? work. So why don't you why don't yeah. you draft a new state constitution? Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. He really doesn't like tuna, so there you go. <laughs> we tried oh the tuna goodness. casserole. We tried the broccoli casserole. Let's just have him draft a, a constitution. A constitution, yeah, that's more his speed. <laughs> this quill, Tommy. Just put it in your hand. Does it feel good? Oh yeah. yeah. Here's some. Here's some paper. See what you can come up with. <laughs> oh my gosh. So this this new mission to France it it really reinvigorated him. And, well, that's good. And we don't have time to really go into the details of his tenure in Paris, but we need to hit on a few important notes. One of which is that this time in France and this time as a diplomat, naturally, it helped him to get a perspective on matters beyond Virginia. It helped to give him experience in developing his understanding of diplomacy and foreign affairs. In particular, he focused his attention on how commerce and trade could be used to exert influence on foreign powers. And this Uh became something that when he got to his presidency, he really took to heart it didn't work out so well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's become a cornerstone of foreign relations, but in the early stages, it it didn't work out so well. But and, and this wasn't anything. This wasn't something that was regularly done at the time. But he just had this idea. He's like, why why are we fighting all these wars when maybe there are other ways to exert influence besides you know using our military? So this was coming mm-hmm. to fruition in his his thoughts at the time. He had some important relationships during his time in France, including with John and Abigail Adams. He had what seems to be a romance with Mariah Cosway. Ooh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> we like that story. <laughs> yes. But there's another <laughs> personal development that we must discuss around this time. Because in 1787, he sent for his youngest surviving daughter to join him in Paris. But instead of the older enslaved woman who Jefferson had requested to accompany her, his daughter Polly was sent over in the care of a 14-year-old, Sally Hemings. Sally was only five years older than the child who was in her care at the time. It is believed that Jefferson's sexual relationship with Sally Hemings began while they were both in Paris and would continue on for decades after. And in this relationship, there would be multiple children born. And I did do a special episode on the Hemings family in which I discussed um, the four children who grew to adulthood. And that is something that is an important part of Jefferson's legacy in how he provided for these children, but did everything in his power not to acknowledge them Mm -hmm. because all four would eventually gain their freedom in different ways. We'll talk about a couple of them uh, once we get to the end of his life, but they were never really, they were never publicly acknowledged When Sally's existence and their relationship became public, Jefferson just did nothing. He he ignored it. He did not acknowledge it. He just treated it that it's my word against hers. And for how long several biographers did the same thing? Exactly. Well, and, and her voice was never heard. It was just his political enemies and and the things that they said about her were atrocious, just awful. And I think that's one of the reasons, I mean, there's so many reasons why that relationship, especially it being sexual, is not okay. But one of the main reasons was there was such a difference in power, you know, between them that he could abuse that power so easily. And, And he does. 
he does. He turns around and then um, can deny it and act like it's nothing. Um, exactly. Just highly, and, highly um, problematic. Exactly. Well, and and the fact that it was it was not unusual. Yeah. It was well known that. At the time, you know, John Adams commented on it in his correspondence that this was well known that this happened, that enslaved women were used sexually by the people that enslaved them. And if anything was unusual, it was that he actually made sure that they were freed, but Mm. it still doesn't justify and it it still doesn't excuse and it still doesn't the ethical issues of this and and to your point jess you know Mm -hmm. legally he owned her and could do whatever he wanted she didn't necessarily have the right to consent and this is a discussion that that continues on in jefferson scholarship you know what how do we how do we classify this relationship? You know, what was her level of consent? Yeah, she had no level of consent. So yeah. in my in my mind, um, yeah, it was clear. It was clearly rape in my mind. Yeah, and I think because, yeah, agreed. Ahead, yeah, I can't. I can't disagree. I think Annette Gordon Reed seems to make the point that to just classify it that way might remove all agency that Sally may have had. And while there's just maybe a a spectrum of, of different agency that would run among enslaved people. And it's just something to be aware of. Like there's a story that she in France, I believe it was um, illegal to keep slaves. So while she was there in Paris, she could have just stayed. She could have said, you know what? I'm, I'm going to run away. I'm going to do whatever. But there's a story that she became pregnant there and made some kind of deal with Jefferson that I'll go back to you. I'll go back to America with you, but you have to make sure that my, my children will be freed. And that doesn't mean that she had consent and there wasn't this terrible power differential or even that it wasn't rape or that she wasn't 14 or something at the time. But looking at her agency and what role she she may have been able to play to um, even just preserve or protect her family is is something that might get lost if if it's completely written off and not looked at from her perspective, I guess. And it's unfortunate we'll never know like the details of her perspective on that. Yeah. But um, yeah. But whatever decisions she was making was survival mode decisions as opposed to a consenting relationship. I mean, she right. wasn't even of age when it started. So she couldn't even consent if she wanted to at that age by today's laws. And it really points to this was there are things that we can relate to in the past, but it was also circumstances that are quite different from our moral standpoints, our values, our beliefs. But also there are people who at the time thought it was abhorrent. There are people at the time who were shocked and appalled and working to break down the system and I think that's such an important point, Jerry, that, you know, it, it's not just a product of its time. I think it was more acceptable, most likely, and more people were doing it, but it it wasn't just a product of its time because there were people at the time who did see the importance of it. Exactly. And to me, it's interesting that some people so vehemently deny that Thomas Jefferson would ever do anything like that when you look at the idea of enslaving other human beings and talking about them the way that he did, like they were livestock and saying things like you want to have a, a a female slave. She's more valuable than male ones because she can produce more labor to say that someone could be like that, but it would be uh, one step way too far for them to treat their enslaved people as sexual objects or engage in relationships with them, whatever they may have done. That to me is, it's interesting where they draw the line. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and that is one of the most difficult points of studying this point in history and studying, well, really in studying the history of the United States, because there are in, in pretty much in any time in American history, just abhorrent viewpoints and abhorrent viewpoints that are at the time socially acceptable and yeah. people are talking about it. People are writing about it and dehumanizing other individuals on a regular basis, on a common basis. And I, I think what really disappoints people in, who study Jefferson is that, you know, we do see he has a, a vision that's beyond what is and to what could be in certain respects. And then yeah. in others, he just, he really has these huge blind spots and doesn't see just how limited his view is and how, how awful his viewpoints are knowing that he has the potential to think beyond and just doesn't in these instances and the ramifications of that on the lives of individuals and on posterity, on the legacy that he leaves. We've definitely, you know, we've already started that discussion. We'll be talking a a bit more about it at the end. Yeah. But this is an important point in Jefferson's history, and and it is an important point in Jefferson's scholarship. So I I did want to go ahead and and talk about Sally and, and that relationship. But to kind of take us back to this public career and public service that he was serving in, in his time in France. So he had served in France for a number of years. And in November 1788, he requested a leave of absence from his post to be able to attend to personal matters back in Virginia. Naturally, at the time, communication, it took a time for his request to get to the U.S. and for a response to come. In that time, they started a little thing that we'd come to know as the French Revolution. (sighs) He would be in Paris for the early days of that, the storming of the Bastille. Oh, the good times, the good parts, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. yeah the, the, the early, yeah, hopeful the, days. The bon temps, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so he would be there to advise the Marquis de Lafayette on the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. He was able to offer his perspective as the, the author of the Declaration of Independence. But finally, in August 1789, he received permission to return to the U.S., and so he arrived in Virginia in late November. When he got there, upon his arrival, he was handed a letter, and it was an offer from the new president of the United States, George Washington, to assume a role in the new government. He was offered the position of Secretary of State. Ooh, that's a big one. This is a big one, and especially the first Secretary of State. You don't get to be the first of something all that often. So (laughs) one would think that Jefferson would, oh, yes, of course. Uh, He was actually not so enthusiastic at the beginning. Oh, really? He actually enjoyed his time in Paris. He enjoyed being the U.S. minister there. And he knew that this new position as Secretary of State would be involved in not only diplomacy, but also domestic and administrative affairs. And he was just, he he was kind of, is this really what I need to be doing? Yeah, there's not as much time to spend in the garden and and dissecting stuff if you take a job like this. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. He, He valued his time. He didn't want to be shuffling papers. And Washington did give him the choice of remaining as the minister to France, but Jefferson was ultimately, he ultimately decided to accept the post after some encouragement to do so from his friend and associate, James Madison, Mm -hmm. as well as others. They were like, are you kidding me? You really (laughs) need to do this. This, this is, 
This is a big deal. Think of what we can do together, Thomas. <laughs> he finally agreed. And so he assumed office on March 21st, 1790. And during this time, and so um, Washington had assumed office in April of 1789. So this was nearly a year that Washington had been president. And so in that interim time, John Jay, who had been the Secretary of Foreign Affairs for the Confederation government, had been helping Washington out. He, of course, was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but they didn't really have much to do in the Supreme Court at that time. So John Jay was like, yeah, I can, I can help you out with this whole, you know. State Department thing. It's just a little matter. I can help you. <laughs> but then Jefferson arrived on the scene in New York City and he assumed his post. But to get a sense of what the State Department was like when Jefferson took the helms, I thought I would just take a moment to touch on those domestic and administrative responsibilities before moving on to foreign affairs. So when the Department of Foreign Affairs under the Confederation government was restructured as the State Department, there was just the secretary and two clerks. That was it. That was the department. Oh, man. And to think like to get from that to a world where we have the DMV, <laughs> you know, like that's it's just. It was a very start- small operation at first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> very small operation. <laughs> and it really didn't grow much beyond that in Jefferson's tenure. By the end of his time as Secretary of State, there was an undersecretary who acted like a chief clerk. There were four clerks. There was an interpreter, as well as a doorkeeper and a messenger. But that was it. That was the <laughs> State Department. I got to wonder about the doorkeeper. (laughs) Reading stories, it seems like people just went wherever they wanted. They talked to whoever they wanted. Um, I don't know that the doorkeepers were really (laughs) doing their job. I'm picturing this guy just kind of leaned back in his chair, nodding off most of the time. People just walking by. (laughs) Yes. Like, what was his job really? That's what I want to know. Exactly. It couldn't have been that much doorkeeping. Yeah, exactly. How do I sign up for that job? (laughs) I will be the official doorkeeper. (laughs) Yeah, like when the messenger arrives, is it it like, I can't take that. That's the doorkeeper's job. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) So that's a small office just for managing foreign affairs. And managing communications with the nation's diplomats abroad. I mean, that's already a small team. But the small office was also responsible for the taking of the census, Mm. granting patents and copyrights, supervising the, the U.S. Mint, recording land patents, granting ship passports, and managing communications with federal marshals and district attorneys. It must have been very busy. They sound very busy, those those three people. <laughs> and the thing is, like, so with the federal marshals and district attorneys, we typically think of that now as the Justice Department. Right. There was no Justice Department, and there wouldn't be until the Grant presidency. Oh, so wow. on top of everything else, they were also doing all of that. Around the Grant presidency, they finally said, well, let's delegate some of this. <laughs> Yeah, probably. I bet like the doorkeeper at, at some point was like, oh, I'm doing patents today. OK, all right. <laughs> the wheel. Sure. It's yours. I'm supposed to watch the door and <laughs> grant all these patents. Really? <laughs> right. <Come on. laughs> right. Oh, as a, a reflection of this wide range of domestic responsibilities, Jefferson's first major report to Congress wasn't necessarily about foreign affairs. It was his report on coinage, weights, and measures in July 1790. So, you know, kind of, and and he he did understand as he was deliberating, you know, he was going to get into the nuts and bolts of these domestic affairs. And and he signed up for it and, and went ahead and kind of threw himself into it. So the kind of stuff nobody cared about except John Quincy Adams. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. He, Jake Ray was perfect in this role. Yeah, it's like weights and measures. Oh, yes. <laughs> Finally. Th- this is my dream job. <laughs> <laughs> 
And though all of this took up, as you can imagine, a good deal of time for Jefferson and his staff, he still did somehow manage to get around to foreign affairs, as well as other matters that were under consideration by the administration. So one of the early things that came up as Jefferson took his post was there was a big debate on a couple of issues, one of which was Hamilton had put out this proposal for the federal government to assume all these state debts. And it was part of a larger financial fiscal scheme for the nation. Folks were having a problem with that. There was also a huge debate over where the nation's capital should actually be. Naturally, pretty much every state was like, oh, well, relocate here. (laughs) Let's show you our brochure. We have ample parking. It's great. (laughs) We've got an Applebee's. It's good. (laughs) Everyone except Rhode Island was like, don't leave us alone. Don't come to Rhode Island. Do we really have to be a part of this? Uh (laughs) Call me when it's over. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But this was, you know, these were the, the two major debates happening when Jefferson assumed office. And so in the midst of this, we have an early interaction with this guy who's a fellow cabinet member named Alexander Hamilton. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. But to also talk about Jefferson's protege, associate, minion, minion, <laughs> James Madison. At this point, Madison was not necessarily the minion. He was really in more the political leadership role. He, oh, he's the guy behind the curtain. OK, I see. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like he was an influential member of Congress. He was making things happen in Congress. But he was also... Washington's kind of right-hand man at this point. So he had the executive branch. He had the legislative branch. He was making things happen. He was pulling all those strings. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. And Hamilton, likewise, had been a trusted aide to Washington. He had really worked in the, the Constitutional Convention. He had become a leading political figure. And he had the ear of the president. So both of these folks were, in essence, larger political figures than Jefferson. Jefferson had been away in France for all these years. He didn't. He, he knew some of the movers and shakers. He, th- but that wasn't really his thing. He had been in Paris for so long, <laughs> and and he had never been close to Washington. You know, he knew him. They knew one another, but he had never really been close to him. So. At this point, again, we've got these two huge debates going on. And Jefferson decided, you know, I'm going to bring Hamilton and Madison together. Let's have a dinner. Let's just talk things through. Now, it's been questioned how much influence this dinner had. Mm -hmm. It's been called the Compromise of 1790, but we don't really get a sense of just how influential this was. But you still see Jefferson starting to assert himself into the politics of the time, bringing people together to talk about issues. And ultimately, both issues would be resolved. Congress would pass the Assumption Bill, and the site along the Potomac River would be selected as the national capital shortly after this dinner. And I believe um, outside the window, I believe Aaron Burr was singing about it. I'm not sure. Exactly. (laughs) I think that's historically accurate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've heard that. I've heard that. (laughs) But this dinner is seen as being a key moment in breaking the stalemate. And it's debatable whether it was or wasn't, but the stalemate was broken. And Jefferson was starting to assert himself politically in this political realm. It would also be a rare moment of civility between the two Virginians and the Treasury Secretary, as we (laughs) shall see in a moment. (laughs) Because also at this time, and in the realm of foreign affairs, there were difficulties with Great Britain. You know, even though the Treaty of Paris had been signed, the Revolutionary War had ended, Britain had kind of dragged its feet of living up to its end of the bargain and vacating military posts in the Northwest Territory. 
They had also been rather cool to the first U.S. minister to Britain, John Adams. And so Anglo-American relations were not really in a good place. It was an awkward breakup. Like, what do you expect? <laughs> like, you know, it's, it takes a little while before you can see each other at parties and talk and it not be weird. I mean, we just got to have meetups to talk about, you know, who's taking the kids, where, who has the kids this weekend. Yeah. Who gets yeah, what yeah. album. <laughs> yeah. Can you stop occupying the attic? You know, <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah. It, it was awkward. And it was really difficult to negotiate with the British because they didn't send a minister to the U.S. They were like, well, we're not in any big hurry to send somebody to talk with the Americans. And so Washington was like, well, if you're not going to send somebody, I'm not going to send somebody. You know, we tried to send John Adams and you gave him the cold shoulder. So (laughs) whenever you're ready, we're here. And so the British government started out by sending an unofficial representative, George Beckwith. And it wouldn't be until 1791 that they actually sent an official minister, George Hammond. The British love the name George, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of like it too here, you know. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're either Martha Sally or George. And that, that, I think, is a big chunk of Virginia right there. <laughs> it probably covers 60%. John's also a popular one. So. John is a big one, yep. <laughs> yep, so there we go. So so they finally sent an official minister. Formal diplomatic relations were established. But it was in these early relations with the British that we see the first signs of friction between Jefferson and Hamilton. Because with the unofficial representative and then the official minister, Hamilton would have some side conversations with them. And at times in these side conversations, he would contradict or undermine what they had heard from Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State and supposedly the minister in charge of foreign relations. Naturally, word got back to Jefferson about this, and he would protest Hamilton's interference in State Department affairs. But it was Hamilton, and so nothing really was done. Hamilton just kept on kind of putting his finger in this pie. Hamilton's got a Hamilton. Yeah. Am I confused? Didn't he do this to Adams as well? He did it to him later, confused? yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, later. He... Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, I was like, this sounds awfully familiar. This is, seems to be a pattern for Hamilton. Yeah. And as listeners who have listened to the Alexander Hamilton episode know, we talked about this, Hamilton was very much, he was in foreign relations, he was in the army, let me tell you about the Navy, (laughs) I'll tell you about the post office, whatever. He he was, he did not have boundaries. He liked to run things. (laughs) He liked to run (laughs) everything. He was very much involved in all aspects of government, and this got on Jefferson's nerves, as one could imagine, you know, Jefferson's starting this new position, and and here he's got this guy basically trying to undermine him. So relations between the two soured very quickly. This, however, was just a sideshow in Jefferson's issues with Hamilton, because Hamilton had this grandiose vision for the fiscal plan for the nation. He thought that there should be a national bank. He was all about assuming the debts of the states. He proposed these tariffs, taxes, this entire scheme. And Jefferson and Madison kind of looked at this and they were like, what is going on here? This something doesn't seem right. You know, first of all, this is this really constitutional Even if it is constitutional, is it really what we want to do? And in particular, Hamilton's proposed Bank of the United States, Jefferson felt was extremely unconstitutional. Where in the Constitution did it say that we could make a bank, a national bank? And he pointed this out to President Washington. And Washington sided with Hamilton and approved of the bank. Mm -hmm. So this frustrated Jefferson. You know, the fact that here he is, he's got this 
established career. He's he's got all this experience. And who is this guy Hamilton coming in and Washington's listening to him? Jefferson and Madison eventually came to the conclusion that Hamilton's influence had to be countered. And if they couldn't convince Washington, because both of them were trying, Washington, really, this this guy, you you don't need to listen to him. Listen to us. Washington right. wasn't listening. If they couldn't convince Washington, then they'd have to turn to other avenues of political influence. So first of all, they started reaching out to people who had expressed opposition to the administration. They even took a trip in spring of 1791 to New York and Vermont to talk to leaders in that area. But the biggest action that they took was to engage a college classmate of Madison's, this guy named Philip Freneau. They talked with Freneau about starting up a newspaper, which they could use as a vehicle to get their ideas out there. Again, you know, we get back to this idea of Jefferson starting up newspapers to yeah. express opinions that, you know, maybe they're not out there. We, we need a vehicle. It's the birth of media, really. <laughs> exactly. You know, he, he's taking the, the Rupert Murdoch approach mm-hmm. to things, <laughs> right. you know, the, the Hearst approach. But <laughs> the thing was, for no, you know, he, he was a poet. He, he had done some publishing. He had been, he had worked on newspapers before, but he really needed money to get a new newspaper going, and especially this newspaper that Jefferson and Madison kind of envisioned being this nationwide newspaper. So to get him some money, Jefferson hired Furneaux as a translator for the State Department in August 1791. Oh, okay. So does he translate what what the doorman says to the messenger? Or are there a lot of diplomats that... <laughs> so he he only knew French. Oh, limiting. <laughs> Any work that was not French, he would have to contract out. But he was hired as the official translator and collected a government salary. And so Frano, at the end of October in 1791, launched the National Gazette, and it quickly became the voice of the opposition to Hamilton and the administration. And did everybody know that Furneaux was behind this? They came to know that Furneaux was behind this. You know, at first it was a, a little kind of, it seemed like it was a little under the radar, but they finally started putting two and two, you know, together. Oh, this guy Furneaux, he's, isn't he the guy that works at the State Department? Is that the same guy? I mean, how many <laughs> Philip Furneaux's can there be in the U.S.? <laughs> and a person that, really was not so pleased when he put two and two together was President Washington. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he would increasingly become frustrated with Furneaux's paper, and Furneaux would eventually turn his criticism to Washington himself. And anybody who knows anything about George Washington knows that George Washington does not take criticism lightly. <laughs> right. Furneaux would take it a step beyond because supposedly he even sent multiple copies of his paper to the president's house each day just to poke the bear. And that's glorious. yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So there are growing tensions in the cabinet. Increasingly in the cabinet, Jefferson and Hamilton find themselves at loggerheads in their interactions In most of the disputes, so the Secretary of War, Henry Knox, would support Hamilton's position. Attorney General Edmund Randolph often sided with Jefferson. Jefferson and Hamilton would appeal to Washington. And this just became a vicious cycle. And finally, Washington was like, I've had enough. He wrote to both of them and he's like, look, we are all working together. I'm tired of your disputes. We need to find a way to work together. We are all working towards a common interest. Uh It didn't help that Washington at this point was trying to decide whether he should retire or not because it was getting towards the end of his first term. And he's like, you know, one and done. I I think that sounds good. Yeah. Up until then, like Washington was, I mean, he he was a general. He was the leader. Nobody was questioning him. And it was all like military and cool and bullets whizzing. 
And now it's like all political and there's people writing stuff about him that's negative. I imagine that had to just not be fun at all. And to look at, you know, the folks that he had hired and see that some of them were responsible for this. Uh. Yes. Well, and, and especially when you got these two folks coming to President Washington, did you hear what Hamilton said? President Washington, <laughs> can you believe what Jefferson had to say about this? He right. was just, he was exhausted. He was, he was tired of this drama. Right. But there was one thing that Hamilton and Jefferson could both agree on. Washington needed to serve a second term, particularly with the growing factionalism that they were in part responsible for. They felt that the nation needed Washington as a unifying figure. They needed the, him to help to keep the nation together. Because otherwise, it would be this huge battle over who was going to be the next president and who knows where that would lead. President Washington, we just need you to serve for another term. Washington was finally convinced. But after Hamilton and Jefferson and others convinced him to stand for another term, Jefferson started thinking about resigning. I'm just convinced Washington's sign on for another four years. I think my work's done. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like a good time to step out. Yeah. It doesn't seem right. <laughs> yeah. And and Washington wasn't too pleased when Jefferson started talking about resigning because he's like, you just talked me into four more years. Right. Where do you think you're going? <laughs> really? <laughs> right. Jefferson would not leave his post soon enough, though, to avoid being embroiled in the controversies with Franco-American relations in 1793. So here we get back to that little pesky French Revolution thing going on <laughs> across the pond. Is that still happening? That is still <laughs> happening, and it's taken an increasingly radical turn. So in mm. August 1792... Louis XVI was deposed as king, and after a trial that was pretty much decided on before it even began, he was sentenced to death. His execution would have an impact on how Americans viewed the revolution in Europe, especially considering that France at that point had declared war on Britain and the Netherlands. So they had declared war on two nations, started the French Revolutionary Wars. So during the Revolutionary War, during the American Revolutionary War, in order to get support from France for their cause, the U.S. had entered into a Treaty of Alliance with France, which stated that either party was supposed to come to the defense of the other in case of war. And it really didn't stipulate, didn't have any clauses about if the war was declared by the other nation or not. <laughs> no details, huh? If they go into war, you're supposed to support them. I mean, were we really serious about that, though? <laughs> I mean, we're just a new nation. We can't help with other people's wars. <laughs> and that is pretty much where the administration was. Because as discussed in the Henry Knox episode of our special series, the U.S. Army was minuscule at this point, and especially compared to European forces. There really wasn't a U.S. Navy to speak of. They had started to build some ships, but nowhere near completion. Even if they wanted to, the Washington administration was just, they, they knew there was no way we could go to war. But... The situation was then further complicated by the arrival of the new French minister to the U.S., a revolutionary named Edmond Charles Genet. Genet was rather of a bombastic figure who had already been declared persona non grata by Catherine the Great in Russia. So naturally, this guy who had been thrown out of Russia by <laughs> Catherine the Great was the perfect guy to come to the U.S. and convince the Americans to support the French cause. This <laughs> was our guy. Genet arrived in the U.S. in Charleston, South Carolina in 1793. He was greeted with enthusiasm. You know, at this time, folks were still, you know, the French are our allies. They are going through a revolution just like us. Hurrah. Everything's great. <laughs> it wasn't all just dinner and parties for Genet, though. Genet had ships commissioned in Charleston 
and he actively recruited American volunteers to join French attacks against the British. Oh, that's within his power, right? An ambassador gets to take over um, other countries' armies and navies and create them, I think. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's that's what Genet thought. <laughs> but, of course, we realize if American sailors and ships start attacking the British, guess what's going to happen? This is going to drag the Washington administration and the U.S. into a war that the administration really doesn't want. Genet ends up going to Philadelphia, which was at the time the capital. He received a warm welcome there. President Washington at first was debating, you know, as Genet was on his way, do I receive him? What's going on here? What is this new government in France? You know, is it is this really a legitimate government? Jefferson convinced him to receive this new minister. Washington wasn't too happy about it, but he did receive Genet. But he quickly grew tired of Genet and his encouragement of the Democratic Republican societies, these factionalist societies that Washington viewed as undermining national security. He grew tired of Genet's efforts to recruit support for the French war efforts. And even Jefferson, who, of course, started out supporting Genet, oh, he loved the French, he loved the revolution, this Genet guy is great, even Jefferson started sour on him. I mean, Mm. that's how bad he was. You know you're too much when Jefferson is like, yeah, you're just a little too French (laughs) for what's happening here. Just a little step too far. (laughs) So in order to steer the nation away from war, President Washington issued his neutrality proclamation of April 22nd, 1793, which asserted not only that the U.S. would remain neutral in the war between Britain and France, but also that the nation, that the government would prosecute any American who provided assistance to the war efforts of either nation. Because they knew if Americans start to get involved in this war, even if it's not sanctioned by the government, we're going to get drawn into this. There's going to be problems. There's going to be an accident. We're going to get drawn into this. We need to just stop this right now. This proclamation did not stop Genet, however. He continued to organize privateers to attack British vessels, as well as organize folks in the western parts of the U.S. to attack Spanish-held North American lands. So he kept on just as he was doing. And finally, Everyone in the cabinet had had enough. And in another rare moment that Hamilton and Jefferson saw eye to eye, they worked with Washington to draft a letter of complaint to Genet. And then Jefferson, very gladly at Washington's order, sent word to the U.S. minister to France to request that the French government recall Genet. Hmm. Au revoir, Genet. (laughs) Au revoir, Genet. (laughs) Mais... Man, there's a little bit more here because there had been a change of government in that time. And rather than just recall him, this new government, which was a bit more radical and they were engaged in this thing that would come to be known as the reign of terror. (laughs) Not at the time. They didn't call it that. That wasn't. Not at the time. I mean, (laughs) no. If you called it the reign of terror at the time, you were probably led to the guillotine. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, yeah. even the folks in charge, like, yeah, you know what? Let's start a reign of terror. Let's just. <laughs> Let's terrorize. Have we thought of the reign as sunshine and lollipops. <laughs> that may be better. But so this new government issued an arrest warrant for Genet. And everyone knew when word came of it that basically if Genet went back to France, they were sending him to his death. So Genet appealed to the Washington administration for asylum. And again, you know, this rare moment that Hamilton, Jefferson saw eye to eye, even Hamilton was in agreement to grant Genet asylum, even though they had viciously disagreed. You know, he, he was not a fan of Genet from the beginning, but he was like, you know, Let's let him stay. And so Genet would end up living out the rest of his life in the U.S. So it's basically, we all agree, this guy needs to be fired. But (laughs) let's not kill him. 
we're not willing to go that far. Yeah. Right. We don't like his work, but we don't necessarily want him dead. I mean, just just stop bothering us. Stop trying to recruit people for war. We'll be fine. Just go <laughs> go live out the rest of your days. It's fine. And but remember this, Janae. You know, don't start trouble because remember that time that we didn't send you back to get killed. Yeah. We can send you back at any time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Total recall is what'll happen. We've we've got the boat ready and waiting. <laughs> So, with all of the drama of the Genet affair behind him, Jefferson finally had had enough. He wrapped up his official business. He resigned from his post as Secretary of State on December 31st, 1793, and returned to his home, Monticello. Now, I'm pretty sure that we are all aware that the end of his tenure at the State Department was not the end of Jefferson's public career. And that career has been and is currently being discussed in much more detail than we have time for in this episode in our narrative series. So I'm going to do a quick high level overview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, no, I, 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 really, I don't have too much more. I believe Jefferson, in you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've condensed it this far. <laughs> this is you Jefferson. Got this. The you got six this. volume series. I quick know. high level. It was a cold morning on <laughs> June. <laughs> So Jefferson went back to Monticello, but he continued to correspond with Madison and others that were still involved in government. He was still, you know, working the political machinations. So in the 1796 presidential election, Madison rallied support for Jefferson, but Jefferson only managed to come in second place, which meant by the rules of the time, he became vice president in one of the most awkward president, vice president relations. (laughs) Yeah. Maybe that's the first time they realize that maybe that wasn't the best idea to make the, <laughs> the runner up the vice president. But just wait, it gets worse four <laughs> years later. Oh, no. But as vice president, Jefferson continued to rally opposition forces against the administration. He and this is where we get to the Kentucky and the Virginia resolves. And uh, so he's not a company guy, you know. He's yeah. not. He's he's not yeah. a team player. No. <laughs> so. Madison wrote the Virginia Resolves, which were a bit more tempered. Jefferson wrote the Kentucky Resolves, which were a bit more radical and extreme. In the Kentucky Resolves, he suggested that states could just nullify federal laws that they didn't agree with. Oh, wow. And this would be used down the line a few decades later by this guy, John C. Calhoun and other pro-slavery politicians. Calhoun! Here we go. I just can't take that guy. Here we go. Jefferson said it. You know, this this has got to be true. This is the revered Jefferson saying this. Now, I know we're high level, but these resolutions (laughs) were anonymous at the time, right? Yes. But by Calhoun's time, was it known that this came from Jefferson and now it's sacred? Was it? Yeah, it it was pretty much known at that time that this was the work of Jefferson and Madison and that faction. And, and so there was a bit more gravitas to it, you know, that there was this Jefferson connection. But we get to the even more awkward 1800 presidential election. Jefferson was back up against John Adams, but this time... Thanks to the oddities of presidential elections at the time, Jefferson ended up tied with his own running mate, this guy named Aaron Burr. <laughs> tied then, with your own running mate? Yes. That's that's so bizarre. And they really started to do a rethink here. Maybe right. maybe we need to do presidential elections a little different. Because yeah, you didn't <laughs> vote for, for president and vice president separately then. It was like you voted for president and the second place got the vice presidency. It was, I mean, not that our elections make perfect sense now when you think about stuff like the Iowa caucus and your head explodes. But right. back then it was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> That's yes. pretty wonky. We we finally figured out that on the two ballots, you need to designate this one's the presidential ballot. This one's the vice presidential. Right. But they hadn't figured that out yet. But the political mess was sorted out. Jefferson became the third president. And just in a nutshell, I've covered this in 30-something episodes thus far, but (laughs) 
basically Jefferson's presidency was all about smaller government, reducing the national debt. Then we get to the Louisiana Purchase, which was an expansion of government, getting more into debt. Jefferson didn't think it was constitutional. He did it anyway. It happened. <laughs> it's water under the bridge, you know? <laughs> Guys, we have a lot more land now. Let's just not talk about it. Let's explore it, though, and bring me some mammoths. That's that's basically what everybody said to him. Just just focus. We'll find you some mammoths. Just just quiet down about that whole we need another constitutional amendment to make this happen. Whatever. So also during his presidency, his old foe in the cabinet, Alexander Hamilton, was killed in a duel with the sitting vice president, Aaron Burr, who then went on to conspire to either split off the Western U.S. or take over Mexico, take over West Florida, all of the above, combination thereof. Who knows? It's a Burr conspiracy. We've been talking about it in the podcast. <laughs> there's there's much more about that. Um, there was conspiring. That's that's what we can say for there certain. Was so Burr was up to he was up so Burr, some conspiring. <laughs> Burr was Burr was being shady. He was arrested. He was tried. He was found not guilty. And wow. Jefferson blamed John Marshall for it. Hmm. Then we have the Chesapeake Leopard Affair, which was a drama off the coast of the U.S., which exacerbated tensions between the U.S. and Britain. Uh, I've got an episode Chesapeake that, Leopard. What? Chesapeake Leopard, the USS Chesapeake, and the HMS Leopard. I love those boat names. <laughs> yes. They, they, they knew how to name a good boat back in the day. Except I hate, there's something called the, the alligator that I hate because when I'm trying to do research on like John Quincy Adams' fake pet alligator, the, all these boat things come up. And I'm like, you are not helpful. <laughs> they did not think about search queries when they named these boats. <laughs> Clearly not. They they did not have the foresight to think of that. <laughs> oh, maybe it was a conspiracy. Oh, maybe maybe this was Burr Clearly Burr's conspiring against you. Yeah, he created the filibuster Obviously. accidentally. This guy, you know, this somebody guy, really needs to do something about this him. This guy, this guy. Well, Jefferson tried, and that didn't turn out well. But yeah, anyway. so he farmed it out to his VP. <laughs> exactly. Or wait, no, that got rid of Hamilton. Yeah, Burr. That got rid of Hamilton. He he uh. needed George Clinton to come in and and have a duel with Burr. You know, oh, gosh. <laughs> anyway. So tensions are are ramping up between the U.S. and Britain. This whole idea of using commerce and economic pressure to influence foreign powers. Jefferson kind of pulls that out of the the files, and he's like, well. You know, let's let's go ahead and put in this embargo act. Let's really try to make this happen. Well, it was an absolute failure. The end of his presidency was just everybody couldn't stand the embargo act. They were like, get rid of this. This isn't working. He ends up leaving the presidency at this point. He had served two terms. He was like, I want to get back to Monticello. I want to get back to my gardens, my to hobbies, my to my <laughs> sheep. All of this, <laughs> take take the deadly ram yeah. and just go home. Yep. <laughs> so he went back to Monticello. He continued to farm. He kept up a steady correspondence. He dealt with tons of visitors. He continued to enslave individuals, just as you do back in that. Time. Per the per the use, yeah. Per the use. <laughs> He was heavily involved in the founding of the University of Virginia. He was the principal designer of the buildings. He helped to design the first curriculum as well as recruit professors. And he was really passionate about this university. He wanted it to be a secular university that was free of religious influence. And, you know, the University of Virginia is still there. It is one of the things that he considered a major legacy of his, his life. He also finally reconciled with John Adams. They kept up a correspondence for the rest of their lives, which touched on a multitude of subjects. And their correspondence is studied by folks to the present day. It's seen as being one of these great epistolary back and forths, mm -hmm. you know, really trying to understand the times and understand one another in their careers, their legacies. Despite his focus on reducing the national debt, 
Jefferson never managed to get his personal finances in order, especially since he just wouldn't stop at buying expensive things or constantly building and rebuilding parts of Monticello for decades. And so when he passed away on July 4th, 1826, which was the same day that John Adams passed away, which y'all discussed in the right. second series. <laughs> yeah, looking at just how coincidental was that? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And if anybody hasn't heard that episode, I highly recommend checking it out. <laughs> when he passed away, Jefferson was so heavily in debt that Monticello had to be sold. And even worse, there was an auction to sell off the enslaved individuals that he had owned. Though the Hemings family worked to save at least some of their family members, there were many individuals in this auction who were sold away from their families, never to be seen again. Jefferson only freed four individuals in his will, two of whom were his own sons, by Sally Hemings, so that people didn't realize that they were actually his own children, Jefferson wrote in his will that he was freeing them so that they can continue to serve their uncle, John Hemings, who was also freed in the will. He was one of the four. He said that he was freeing them so that they could continue to serve John Hemings as his apprentices. So he, even to the very end, tried to deny this relationship. And Sally Hemings was not freed in the will, but she was informally as they called it, given her time by Jefferson's daughter, Martha, and she lived the rest of her life nominally free. It was an off-the-books way to free enslaved individuals. And, And she was basically considered free, but legally, that's a gray area. Hmm. But that is the life and career of thomas jefferson wow wow well done jerry yeah that was a great job condensing the all the big stuff and i I learned some things in there and it really put his life in perspective i think yeah yes and and we've already started to discuss this but just going into our categories and i think this is a good time to kind of just jump into the whole picture. So this category looks at the overall career and character of the cabinet member. And just to let y'all know, um, since there are two of you, I will condense your two individual scores. You will have the average and then we'll add it to my score. And that will be the total for this round. Gotcha. All right. Or me and Howard can discuss and be one person. Whatever's easiest. (laughs) (laughs) I already have the Excel spreadsheet set up. Oh, got it. You're good. Okay. (laughs) I was going to say, whatever's easiest and less math for you. (laughs) So thoughts on his his life and career? I mean, who wants to go first? (laughs) I mean, Jefferson is, is endlessly fascinating. And when I think about his contribution to the United States, I, I have a lot of questions. I wonder, what if John Adams had written the Declaration of Independence? Would it have been just as good? Would it have made the same impact? Maybe. Um, what if Adams had won another term or, or Burr had won? And I mean, Jefferson's looked at as this great thought leader, but I, I, it's hard to necessarily differentiate some of those thoughts from, from Madison or others. So sometimes I wonder if his contribution to the United States has been overstated. Um, but it, it, it's, it's tough to really think about that because he was such a large figure um, in the cabinet in creating this party um, and the party system and then being the one to really go up against Hamilton as far as that. I don't know that anybody else could have done that in the way that he did. I, I don't know if Madison would have been successful as the public face um, in the same way that Jefferson was. That being said, um, I, I don't know. Ranking him is very hard looking at the the whole picture. Um, I mean, when you look at his words about freedom 
and his ideas about the ideals of what America could be, um, y- you want to rank him really high. I want to rank him high when I look at that stuff. When I look at the realities of his situation and some of the terrible things he thought and some of the things he did that helped pave the way for the Civil War and kicking the can of slavery down the road when it was well within his power to have done so much more than he did. I don't know that he could have fixed everything and, and um, completely eradicated the institution of slavery in the United States, but I know that he could have done more than he did. Um, even if he just managed his finances better, he personally could have done more than he did. So it's, it's tough. Um, I'm, so I'm supposed to pick a number between one and 10 that talks about the whole picture of Jefferson. Um, yes. Not just as a cabinet member, but as a, 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 a person. Wow. Yes. Yeah. So th- this is his entire life and career. And, and we do have a category where we can get into more of the, the, the disgraceful parts of his okay. life. Keeping um, that in takeaway points, yeah, is good. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I'll give him a five. I think that his contradictory nature um, and the, the ways he might have set things back might be balanced out in a way by some of his his positive contributions, and that we can't just let all the bad stuff completely overshadow um, the positive parts of, of his ideas for what the nation could be. Wow. Howard. So you make me feel a little better because I, I thought mine was low. So I, I feel a little better. Um, and because I agree with everything you're saying, I really think that's a good point. Like to point out that could his shoes been easily filled by someone else around him? Um, or were his ideas that unique? Uh, and, um, he did have visions, you know, but he, like I said earlier, he never walked the walk. And so he just, um, was very caught up and limited by his own institutions that he put in place and relied on. So I, you know, as I've learned more about Jefferson through Howard and through Jerry, I just feel rather disgusted (laughs) in, in some ways. And I can't seem to shake that disgust. Um, the way he subhumanized the people he enslaved um, and how he was, even on his deathbed, unwilling to give them freedom um, in a true fashion. And even then, only four, you know, and and then still couldn't take ownership of his decisions, which he must have felt ashamed of in some capacities since it was very important to him to not own up to it. So, again, I, I have trouble giving him too much credit at this point in my life <laughs> with, with, with learning about Jefferson anyway. Uh, so I would, I was thinking about a five or a six as well. So I'll go for a six. How about that? Sounds good. I've got you down for a six and, okay. and I think, I think I'm going to go for a, I think I'm going to go for a six as well. And I I think both of you made really good points and it's, we can't deny that Jefferson had a lasting influence and impact. His career had a lasting influence and impact on the United States and on U S history in terms of his presidency. The big thing is, the Louisiana purchase, you know, that Mm -hmm. changed the United States forever. The legacy is not always that great. And how much of it was Jefferson versus the people. And, and that does have to be taken into account. You know, he was good at drawing on other talent, Mm -hmm. bringing in folks who would help to, kind of temper his knee-jerk reactions. The fact that he had James Madison as his his minion for so long, <laughs> um, he knew that he needed Madison. And 
Jefferson could not have been Jefferson. He could not have gotten to where he got to without Madison. Yeah. But what does that say about Jefferson? You know, and, and you know, Jefferson constantly in presidential rankings gets close to the top. When you consider his presidency, it, it really is a mixed bag. Yeah. You know, was it really a great presidency? And when you look at, I'm just going to say, when you look at Madison's presidency in the War of 1812, which overshadows it, there were a lot of seeds of that planted in Jefferson's presidency. And I don't think he gets enough um, opposite of credit (laughs) for for that. Accountability. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Blame. Yeah. Exactly. You know, Jefferson left. Relations with Britain were worse than ever. We had had the Embargo Act, which you know, really hindered and and hurt the American economy, hurt individuals. And Jefferson just walked away and went to Monticello and Madison deal with this. Yeah. Right. Luckily we are not evaluating his presidency. We're evaluating his time as secretary of state, which gets us Mm -hmm. to our next category, which is the go-getter. The go-getter In this category, we're looking at the impact of the cabinet member during their time in the cabinet. And again, 10 points maximum. But this is really thinking of that tenure as Secretary of State. So what are your thoughts? So I just want to clarify, when you say impact, would a 10 mean they had a a positive impact on the country or or the administration or um, like... Uh, who would be a 10? Like, let's pretend that we're evaluating John Quincy Adams as secretary of state. Mm. And he did all this cool stuff, except, you know, maybe letting Jackson get away with taking over Florida. Um, and, and he would be a 10, but someone who just really was terrible at their job might be a one. Is that kind of. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it really is, you know, it, it's not even necessarily, you know, it, it really is this in terms of their role, you know, that they made an influence on the administration. They made an influence on policy on the, the way the nation went because we do have our, our hot seat category where uh-huh. we can really evaluate the, the not so good things, but just, you know, in terms of their role as a cabinet member, what was that influence and, and or were they influential? Well, I don't know, Howard. I, I mean, what stood out to me when Jerry was talking about this segment was how he was in many ways learning the ropes um, after coming back from Putty. So just kind of... Um, whereas other cabinet members seem to have more strings that they were pulling and more um, networking going on and more juggling. He seemed to be diving into it, but very much not as smooth of a juggler. Um, And that's just, that was just my interpretation of it. Um, But I think it sounded like he, he dove in and then learned the ropes and then, um, and then applied that, to trade, even though it was very unpopular, and just to find ways of of foreign policy without the war. You know, I, I appreciate that about him, that even though it was unpopular, he was looking for other ways of relating to the rest of the world. So what, what so number? I'm, oh, I, gosh, I don't know. I need to hear what you're going to say, and then I'll give my number. No, that's not fair. That's a is that, not, is that cheating? A little, <laughs> well, you know well, more about him. I kind of want to hear your input and then I'll see if I agree. And then that might change my number. But right okay. now I'm at a five. How about that? I'm at a five right now, but it might change after what you're going to say because you're more of an expert than I am. Well, I'm, I don't know if I'd say that, but. I'm not even close to an expert. I'm not an expert at all. Let's just put it that, <laughs> <laughs> that way. <laughs> Which your perspective is uh, almost more valuable because of that to evaluate the things you've heard. And that's an interesting, that's a very interesting interpretation. But (laughs) Um, when I look at Jefferson as, as a secretary of state, um, I mean, there's certain things that are against him. I mean, you know, nobody likes a quitter, you know, that's one. Um, And he was actively trying to undermine his administration. 
you know, when you when you take a big problem. <laughs> yeah. When you take federal funds to basically create a newspaper trashing your boss, um, that's not cool. Uh, at the same time, he probably did broker quite a compromise that allowed for a national bank and move the capital to a swamp. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think that he played well for a while, but then the the undermining of Washington is hard for me to get around. But I think yeah. that he was still very influential i have to go with a six so i don't feel so bad about my number i'll keep my number <laughs> i just don't want to i want to make sure i'm not way off that's all no oh no i think you make should sure be an i'm outlier. not totally misinterpreting everything i'm hearing <laughs> no i and and again both of you made really good points you know, and that's one of the things evaluating jefferson as secretary of state he did lay the groundwork, you know, and again, you, you rarely get the opportunity to be the first of something. And he was the first secretary of state. He kind of set the the standard for it. And in terms of what he did, it, he had successes. He had, and he had an influence he didn't have quite as much of an influence and, and his influence with Washington seemed to wane over time, but he was increasingly having this political influence and he had a major role and a major, and, and I think this grew over time is his role in the debate over how things were going to go in terms of foreign affairs, in terms of domestic policy. Mm -hmm. He may not have been quite as influential with the president, but he was increasingly influential with the movers and shakers. He had an increasing visibility, an increasing profile. And so I think that we do have to acknowledge that, that he was a success in that way, even if he wasn't necessarily able to achieve as much in terms of steering the president, you know, and you still, mentioned, yeah, you, you mentioned the debate and I mean, thinking about like, uh, uh Lindsay Chervinsky's book on the cabinet and she talks about how it was really a team of rivals. It sounds like Washington wanted that debate. He wanted mm -hmm. someone who was bringing ideas that he wouldn't necessarily have been hearing or having himself. Now, whether he ended up disagreeing with that and didn't like being undermined, well, sure. But in, in having that debate and presenting those thoughts, I think he really was delivering for Washington uh, at the beginning. Absolutely. Well, and, and you see in the later parts of Washington's administration, when it becomes a very federalist leaning cabinet and, and federalist dominated cabinet, Washington doesn't have the perspective that he did in the early days of his presidency when he had Jefferson there making mm -hmm. those arguments, when he had Randolph making arguments a little softer, a little more moderate when he had these other opinions, it, it did play a valuable role in Washington's ability to lead. Now I feel like I need to change my number, Jerry. Yeah, I'm almost leaning <laughs> toward a, a higher number I'm now. I'm leaning but... towards a six or a seven now. <laughs> it, it is easily changed. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm going to go for a, I'm going to go for a, a six. I'm going to raise mine a point. Yeah. Now we're at a average six instead of 5.5. .5. That might be a good, you know, um, because there are other categories, uh, let's, right. I want to move That's to a seven. To. Nice. Yeah. This might have been one of his strengths. Yeah. But if yeah. you disagree, after, Jerry, after now's your Jerry's time. 
Yeah. I, you can change I, yours I, to a four now if you want. If you need the balance <laughs> no, I, I want to hear I think, Jerry's score. I, I think I'm going to go with a seven as well. Wow. And, and just, you know, really thinking of this. This really was a high point in Jefferson's career. And, and I would say arguably in some ways, maybe even more so than his presidency, you know, mm-hmm. he, he really had an impact and, and, and again, you know, this, this idea that he was the first and really established this office. Um, I, I think we do have to take that into consideration. And there was no yeah. manual for it at that point. You know, exactly. he, he really was paving the road for that position. I mean, Hamilton probably wrote a manual at some point for it. <laughs> <laughs> Jefferson may not have read it, but. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> but now we can get to the hot seat category, which discusses any disgraceful behavior of or actions committed by the cabinet member. And this doesn't have to be during their tenure of office in the cabinet. So in this category, we will be removing points. It will Mm -hmm. be a a penalty round. So, All right. There's a lot of points I'd like to remove, Jerry, (laughs) (laughs) for for this category. Um, I think he showed disgraceful behavior throughout his life. Uh, undermining women, undermining um, the folks he enslaved. Um, And yeah, and then again, yeah, some of his conduct even professionally um, was pretty disgraceful. So tell me how to remove points. Do I start at 10, like as a perfect human being, and then I go from there, subtract down? So you can remove up to 10 points. I see. Okay. Yeah. Man. And it's really tough. And this is one of the things that, that I discussed on an earlier episode. Um, you know, whenever you're, whenever slavery is in the mix in this category, there is no, there's no way to quantify it. There's no way to quantify the injustice and, and the, the, inhumanity of it right it's like how could i leave any points at all <laughs> yeah, you, yeah you can't it's kind say of my, oh, my quandary you can't say oh you had the statute on religious freedom that's worth a hundred slaves there's yeah you're right you can't <laughs> right, exactly yeah. it just doesn't work that way exactly it's like yeah. and it ultimately comes to you know one of the things that i think of is just you know uh, of course somebody who enslaves individuals you know you're you're getting points in this round it really comes to you know adding in what else happened and and Mm -hmm. with jefferson there is there is a lot of quite a bit (laughs) other things you've got you know the the betsy walker affair right where he sneaks into her room with, you know, he sneaks into her room without her permission. And this is a friend of his that he's um, completely brushing aside. It To me, it's that alone would, would subtract a bunch of points. And then you add on yeah. slavery. And then you add on, like you said, the Virginia notes uh, where he describes his slaves as animals. It's just, it's disgusting. Yeah. And then you add on, of course, an underage girl, but not just an underage girl, an underage girl where there's a complete discrepancy of power where she isn't trapped. Yeah. And then on top of that, you add on the, the fact that he can't even own up to that. And then on top of that, you add on that he can't even free them civilly or all his slaves on his deathbed. You know, it's just so I'm going to have to take away all his points, Jerry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm taking away 10 points. I can't. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that seems like a good place to start. Cause yeah, like, like you said, I mean, he, it wasn't just that he enslaved people, which a lot of people did and that doesn't make it right. But he 
had these ideals about freedom and he said a lot of things that made it very clear that he knew the institution was terrible. He knew it was He wrong. knew the right answer. That's the thing. He 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 knew the right thing to do and he didn't do it. Yeah. And then and, he, and then did it did the bad thing in the worst way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he invented like a pseudoscientific rationale for enslaving human beings which impacted generations after that and and impacts to this day, I would say. Yeah, and in many ways he undermined the country that he helped declare independence for, not just in the administration, like funding a, a newspaper against it, but uh, yeah, writing the Kentucky resolutions that basically said, if you don't like what the government does as a state, you don't have to listen to it, which was basically a way of opening the door to secession and, and civil war. So there's so much wrong that he did because in this round, we're not looking at the good. We're only looking at the bad. And when you look at all of these things, um, it's hard not to to take away 10 points because, I mean, what should I only take away nine? Because he didn't actively murder people. Um, I, I don't know if it is negative 10 Hitler. I don't know what we look at, but I think there's enough stuff that I, I would also take away 10 points because the expectations of him are higher because of his brilliance, because of all the good things. When you look at the bad stuff, uh, you really do need to place blame on him. He was not a product of his And because he time. knew better. And yeah. because he knew better. Yeah. Yeah. And I am going to join y'all in the 10 points because just it was a an awful legacy. You know, it, it, there's so much, there is a good legacy to Jefferson. You know, he, his expressions of freedom and human liberty have inspired so much good, but his words, his other words also inspired so much evil and hurt so many people over the ages. I the individuals that were directly impacted, the individuals that were impacted by his legacy, I, I think that his influence for all the good aspects of his influence, there was also just this awful impact. And I don't think that, I don't think that we can give him any less. I think it is justified. So with that, he is uh, with the average of your two scores and then mine. That takes away 20 points. He still got an opportunity to earn a few more points mm -hmm. because then we get to adding points for his tenure of office. So he served as secretary of state from March 22nd, 1790 to December 31st, 1793. So rounded out, that gives him four points. And then we have our bonus rounds, which cabinet members can get one bonus point if they served in more than one full-time cabinet position, which he did not, so he doesn't earn that one. They can get a bonus point if he if they served in a full time cabinet member position in more than one presidential administration. He only served under Washington, so he doesn't get that one. But Jefferson is the first cabinet member to earn the bonus point for becoming president. So he did at least achieve that. And that gets us to the grand total of 10 points for Jefferson. <laughs> All right, 10 points wow. Gryffindor. <laughs> or Slytherin, I think, might be more appropriate. I have such mixed feelings, you know? It's so hard because he he is inspirational in a lot of ways. 
Well, and now we've got to consider after all I've shared about this, about Jefferson's life and career and what we've discussed, do you think that Jefferson is notable enough or impactful enough to earn a seat at the table of the cabinet all-stars? I feel like I don't know enough cabinet members. Honestly, I don't. So I'm going to, I'm going to defer to Howard on this one and I'll, um, tell you what I think after I hear from him. (laughs) When I think, (laughs) when I think of all stars, I think of teams and it's hard to consider him a team player. So I, I gotta say, I mean, when it it comes to a legacy of American history, uh, of course he's up, he's on Mount Rushmore, which I mean, means not that much, but he's there. (laughs) He's on our quarters and our two dollar bills and he has a huge legacy and he looms large but should he be an all-star among cabinet members um just because he was the first no i'm gonna say no what about you jerry what do you think i i agree with that i think that you know jefferson stands out on his own but in terms of his role in the cabinet, and, and he did play a role in the cabinet, but it was almost this dissonant role in the cabinet. He, he was the voice of the opposition in the administration. And so I, I'm good with saying no to his earning a seat at the table. Although I imagine that will be very controversial in terms right. of the listeners. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure all of this is very controversial, you know, in terms of listeners, but I'll have to agree with you then. Um, I'm not as proficient as, you know, among all the cabinet tree members, but I feel like if you're going to compare him, it, it is hard to be the best when you're the first. <laughs> um, but it just seems like, yeah, there was a kind of a disconnect with his own role, like what he was, you know, with his own vision of himself. (laughs) Sometimes he'd contradict and then go against Washington's, you know, it just, he seemed kind of all over the place trying to figure out what his role looked like. Absolutely. I don't know. So I will say no as well. Absolutely. And, And that, that really gets to, you know, he, he established himself as secretary of state. He established himself as a political figure during this time, but, in terms of the administration, was he really was he really serving the administration? Not so much. So I right. I, I think that y'all made some great points and this has been a, a very interesting discussion and evaluation of Jefferson um, as somebody who has been Living with Jefferson for over two years now on the podcast, this has been kind of a fresh take to him, considering him in the light of his role in the cabinet and what did that mean for his overall career. So I cannot thank both of you enough for your perspectives, your insight, and for joining us in this journey through the life, career, and legacy as difficult as it is of Thomas Jefferson. Well, thank you for having us. It it was our pleasure. And it's always, always fun to talk about such a complicated figure and, and look at that complicated legacy and what that means. And, you know, think about America today and how it's still very complicated and um, how Jefferson embodies that because it's, it's a great gateway drug into American history (laughs) and division and legacy. Yeah. I also really enjoyed hearing your review of it, Jerry. I feel like hearing it, I mean, he is such a monster of a legacy, you know, that it's, uh, for me as someone who's not as proficient in history as the two of you are, it's nice to hear it reviewed in that fashion because it helped me put the pieces in chronological order. And so it was, it was refreshing for me as well to kind of compare his legacy in that way to his role and cabinet in the presidency. So thank you. Thank you for having us and thank you for reviewing him with us. Yeah, no problem. I mean, this is, this is what the presidency's podcast is all about trying to 
really look at these figures who have been viewed on pedestals for so long or are just seen in one light and trying to see them as individuals, trying to see them as complicated humans and the many stories and and the complicated legacies that they lead. And Jefferson is definitely one of those figures that there is a lot to dissect and and figure out, but um, this was an amazing discussion. And again, I cannot thank both of you enough. And for our listeners, please, after you get done with this episode, check out Plotting Through the Presidencies. They are in their third season now, have some great episodes coming up, have, have already released some great episodes, so be sure to check them out. And until next time, stay safe and healthy, be kind to one another, and take care, dear friends. Welcome to Anthology of Heroes, the podcast that explores the most pivotal moments of history through the eyes of those who lived it. In this podcast, we don't spend our time recounting facts and dates. Instead, we follow in the footsteps of national heroes, kings, or ordinary people who lived and breathed the moments that shaped our world. We're not hemmed in by eras, borders, or religions. Instead, we seek out the tales of those who defied the odds and fought passionately for their beliefs. Whether they're right or wrong is up to you to decide. From Vercingetorix's doomed rebellion against Rome, to Osceola's unshakable war against the USA, all the way up to the inspiring Sobibor concentration camp uprising in World War II, Each episode is an immersive listening experience, blending music and sound effects to really draw you into the story. Our episodes go for about 45 minutes, making them perfect for your commute, and are crafted using a wealth of historical sources, which I list on our website if you want to learn more. I'm the host, Elliot Gates, and I'm thrilled to have you joining me as we uncover history's hidden gems and illuminate the faded pages of our past. Look out for the Anthology of Heroes podcast on Spotify, Apple Music, or anywhere else you get your podcasts from.